Um, but I just wanted to say, this is this is David Moss. Um, and for those of you who don't know David Moss, um, you're in for just a, a real treat. Um, and I, there are so many people on here who I also don't know. And so you probably know David Moss and don't know me. So I'm Rabbi Rebecca Schatz. Um, I'm, one, I'm the associate rabbi here at Temple Betham. And, um, and David is just a phenomenal artist and someone who brings real beauty to Judaism, both in the way that he talks about it, but also in the way that he creates it. Um, and I'm very lucky to not only call him someone I know as an artist, but as a friend. And just, uh, it's lovely to see you on screen. We would have loved to have you in person, um, but we understand that uh, being in Jerusalem is is definitely much more exciting right now than it is to be in rainy Los Angeles. Um, so thank you so much for being here, David. Sorry for all the technical difficulties, but as you can see, you have you have many fans who do not care when you start. We're just excited to be able to learn from you. So Baruch Chaba, and thank you for uh, thank you for teaching us this morning. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you all for your patience. I really this never happened before, but um, we'll move along. I just thank you all so much. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, with the uh, Beth Am community, and uh, especially since the long connections with the Good Glicks and the and the Peter Siles and the Camp Rama and Pressman kids, and it's all all coming together. Um, so um, I want to I want to just before I start, I'm going to do a PowerPoint so you can see the uh, the images close, and I'll take you through. But just I wanted to show you the book before we start, just so you can get an idea of the scale of it, of the Haggadah that I did, and a few of the special techniques that don't show up in the um, slides so well. It's good for detail, but to see things like this, that's paper cut from both sides, working on both sides, or with little tags. You see how this goes over and then the paper cut lets the image show through from below. And I just want you to have these in mind as we go through the cutouts at the bottom of the page, page by page. The mirrors that reflect as you open it that you'll see more of later, and one or two more. The Korech, the sandwich, which the Moror cut out, the bitter herb on two sides. And the last one, we see that this door opens, and this cup turns, and these are all kinds of things that you won't see in the PowerPoint. So now, um, if you have questions, put them in chat. If you want more information about the Haggadah, I think my publisher, Esther Baruch of Beta Alpha Editions is on. You can put your emails. Oh, I see Esther. Uh, you can put emails in and she'll, she'll be in touch with you about any information about the books, et cetera. Um, there's also from Beta Alpha, since this is about Pesach, this set of free downloadable pamphlets for Seder use called Siman Tov that I did during the uh, COVID so people can download them for free, print them, and use them at Seder. Okay, I'm going to move to the, to the um, share screen and hope that works, that some technology works. Share. Uh-oh. Did I lose that? Here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Thumbs up if you can see my screen. I assume you can. Let me go to my screen. Okay. Um, I'd like to dedicate this talk in memory of a few people that were very important in this 
Pagata project. Uh, Passover is a lot of fours, four questions, four children, etc. So the four people are Richard Levy of blessed memory who commissioned the original of the Haggadah, Neil and Sharon Nori, who when they saw the photograph said it's unacceptable that there's one copy of this book in the world and were determined to publish it in this perfect facsimile edition. And my beloved wife of blessed memory, Rosalind Moss, who enabled my entire career, but in this case, especially was willing to take a project that we thought would be one year and allow it to extend to three years. The book I'm gonna show you was originally a handwritten, hand illuminated commissioned Haggadah. One patron, Richard Levy, one artist, me, to make one unique manuscript. The only requirements that I had were that it should be of large format, traditional in style, and on real animal parchment. The entire book is done on parchment. Very research-based project. Half the time was spent in the library, half the time in the studio. In the library, I was looking at three elements, the evolution of the text of the Haggadah, the commentaries to the traditional Haggadah, and the art history of the medieval Haggadah, illuminated Haggadah. My three principles that you'll see throughout, I'll talk about the pages and you'll see how this works, but these were the principles that I used to make the book. One, first, to listen carefully for what hidden surprise each section might be hinted at. I was looking at the text and looking for that hidden nugget that might be of interest first to me and then to anyone who sees and uses the God. The second is to take and articulate that insight clearly as a fresh creative idea. Every section I wanted to somehow reflect with a new creative idea. And finally, to devise, figure out an artistic way to express that idea and execute it, whatever the effort. Those were the principles on which this book was based. So we'll begin at the beginning. And this is about beginnings as pure potential. The first page, I felt was different from any other page in the book. It has nothing before it, whereas every other page has something before it and after it. What I think I'm thinking is special about beginnings, and I'm thinking especially because of a medieval Haggadah that one has a simple tree as the beginning. I'm thinking about trees and the beginning of a tree as the seed. And the seed of the tree is maybe a apple seed is a quarter of an inch large, yet the tree is dozens of feet tall. The miracle, the idea, the concept that this is based on is the fact that that little seed somehow contains the entire tree. This is about potential and about the beginning containing the whole. That was the core idea of this that every beginning contains the whole and potential. My next tax is to figure out how to give that artistic expression. You see, I've made the tree in the form of the menorah and fruitful and blossoming, but how do I get across the idea that every beginning contains the whole? If you look at the border, you see it's micrographic writing, a, a common ancient, Jewish tradition, and it contains the entire Haggadah. In other words, page one is the beginning, contains everything that's later to come, just as the seed of the tree contains that entire tree potential. This next page, pages, I should say, is about the ebb and flow of Jewish history. Now the 
Talmud tells us that we're the way to tell the story of the Exodus is to begin with degradation and end with praise. But we begin always with the negative and end in thanks and praise to God. And in the Haggadah, that degradation can be that our ancestors were idol worshipers is one beginning and that we were slaves is another beginning both of negativity and degradation. So I wanted to suggest that at the beginning of the book. And the way I did that is entered a text that's never been in a Haggadah before, I assume. And that is a one of the lamentations of Tisha B'Av of the ninth of Av commemorating the destruction of the temple and the, the beginning of the diaspora. I saw the, this is based on the fact that the first night of Passover and the night of Tisha B'Av always fall on the same day of the week. So there's some connection between the holiday of our liberation and our moving from the diaspora to the land of Israel, Passover, and the opposite, the end of our sovereignty and our having to go into exile to Shabbat. So I quoted this beautiful lamentation that uses these two metaphors of when I, it's in the first person, everything was joyous and happy when I went out of Egypt and everything was doom and gloom when I went out of Jerusalem. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. It's an alphabetic acrostic. I put the letter that each verse starts with in its in a little book and you'll see the detail. Each, each stanza is a different subject or metaphor for the exodus and the destruction. And you see that I wrote the happy ones in large letters, the first half of each verse in the large letters. And if you can see below in the tiny micrographic writing, this time in mirror writing is the part, the sad part about going out of Jerusalem. The little orange squares are a Hebrew calendar from the year I started to the Haggadah to the Jewish year 6,000 for what day of the week Passover and Tisha B'Av will fall every year. The next pages is, are the ones that I showed you at the beginning with the cutouts on both uh, cutouts and the image on both sides. And it's based on a Hebrew root of three letters, avad. Now the neutral meaning of avad is work, simple meaning of work, but this root can be used in a very negative way and in a most positive way. It's the word, the root for slavery, for servitude, evid, avadim, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, shiabud, all these meanings. It's also the word used for idolatry, avodah, zara, foreign, strange, servitude. So all these negative, highly negative words, but on the other hand, it's also the most positive because it is the root for service, Avodat Hashem, serving God, Avodat Shebelev, which is the, her service of the heart, which is prayer. Again, as I showed you at the beginning, that's this core idea I'm looking for. Cool. One root of three letters contains both the most negative and the most positive. We're used to always saying that 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 Seder night and the holiday of Passover celebrates our going from free from slavery to freedom, which is absolutely true. But another way of putting this, if you look at that root of Vad, is that we're going from one kind of avoda and work, which is enforced work slavery for a human being or a human goal to divine service, 
English also captures it a little bit from servitude to service, same root. That's the idea. Now as the artist, I need to figure out how to convey, convey this. So as I showed you, I did this with a paper cut. This is the left-hand page showing the servitude part, the slavery part. They're making the bricks, forming them, baking them, bringing the mortar, bringing the bricks, and forced to build the cities for Pharaoh in Egypt. The micrographic border going around are all biblical verses in which the root avad has the meaning of servitude or slavery. You can see it a little closer here. You're looking through the cutouts onto the blue page behind. There you see the detail of them doing the forced labor. Now you're seeing through the page, the cutout, and it's turned now on the other side. And on the other side, we see, let's see if I have the detail now. You see they're now milling the wheat, bringing the water, pouring, mixing, kneading, and baking the matzot for Passover. They've gone from servitude to service. They're doing the mitzvah of baking the matzah for Passover. And now the tiny calligraphy is all Biblical verses in root in which the the meaning of the root is service of God. Never ending quest. I'm going to run through some of these more quickly than others, uh, just because of our time limitations. Um, but. Uh, this has to do with looking at a thing at its essence. It's the search for leaven, which we take every single particle of leaven and we burn it and we sell it and we get rid of it and we wrap it up and we have to get rid of every single particle. So I'm looking at this kind of quest in the outer world, in the scientific world on the right, and the inner world, the spiritual or inner world on the left. Here you see we're looking at the grain, the wheat on the stalk, seeing it closer down to the wheat kernels, cutaway section, down to the starch, and down to the enzyme. These last four are based on the enzyme beta amylase, which is responsible for the fermentation that makes the five grains that were forbidden uh, rise and be leaven. So this idea of the scientific inquiry, you never get to the end. You're always looking deeper and deeper and deeper. This is the search for leaven, and I'm trying to look at that searching process itself. On the other side, there you see the details. And on the other side, there's a long text from the al Sheikh Kodesh. And he's talking about the search for leaven as a spiritual inner search. Again, the psychological inner search never ends. You keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. So this, I, 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 this is inspection and introspection, the outer world and the inner world. That's my metaphor for the search for leaven. Seder, of course, means order, and this is the traditional order of the Seder, Kadesh Rachatz, a memory device to remember the, the way each step, we have 15 steps of the Seder, and this is the way I depicted them. I put the Seder plate in the middle, the haroset, shank bone, maror, parsley, and egg, the four cups of wine here, three matzot that we eat, and two times we wash. So these are all the objects we use through the night. And over here, we are seeing that each of these miniature steps is a miniature of this. And the blank one points you to what object you take throughout the night. So this is a kind of visual graphing 
of the entire Seder of the 15 steps of the Passover Seder. And then I quote throughout the book, I quote these objects as we take them visually. I quote them graphically as we take each one. Kadesh Urachatz. Kadesh points you to cup one. Urachatz sends you over to washing one, etc. Hey, Yakin Haz, you know, I'm going to kind of skip that because it's hard to explain. And uh, it's interesting, but it's based on medieval German Haggadot, which used the acronym for remembering the order of the, of the, of the Kiddush for Saturday night and compares it to a rabbit hunt. Very famous in Jewish art. And this was my interpretation. In great haste, we went out of Egypt. Maybe I'll skip Jewish perversion. The four questions are done also as a paper cut. You see the grays behind and you see that Talmud speaks of four situations as to who asked the questions. Um, if there's a child, the child asks the parent, says the Talmud. If there is no child, the wife asks the husband. If, God forbid, you're doing Seder all by yourself, you'd think you could skip it. But no, they said, even if you're alone, you must ask yourself. And the last case they quote are two Talmuds two great Torah scholars who certainly know the whole Haggadah by heart and much more. Can they skip it? No, they say, even Talmidei Chachamim, even great scholars have to ask each other. That question and answer, that dialogue that forms the essence of Jewish learning is so important that even if you're alone, even if you know, you have to keep asking and asking and asking. See the silhouettes cut into the parchment. We now get to the answer to the question of Adim Hayinu. Our, our ancestors were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God brought us out from there with a great strong hand and an outstretched arm. And if God had not brought us out from there, then we and, and our, our descendants would still be slaves in Egypt. So what was I going to do for Avadim Hayinu? We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And part of my research brought me to another um, very important German uh, Haggadah tradition called the Bird's Head Haggadah the most famous and earliest illuminated German Ashkenazic Haggadah. And you see the Jews are all have these bird faces. They're wearing the hats that they were forced to wear. And here you see the bird's head Haggadah quotes, very bizarre. And I quoted them on this page, visually perched on their perches, little birds. And as I showed you at the beginning, the next page is an intricate cutout with a cage that entraps them. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, our ancestors. They are caged, birds in a cage, wanting to fly free, to be free, yet they cannot. The Haggadah goes on here to say, and if God had not brought us out from there, and it occurred to me that our generation, perhaps more than any in Jewish history, post-Holocaust understands what it means, what it would have meant if we were not brought out from there, what the results could have been. So the cage, 
I suggest the gates of Auschwitz with the very ironic in a Pesach context, Arbeit Mach Frei, Arbeit is work, Avodah, we talked about it, the three letters that capture the essence of Passover. Arbeit, work, makes free. Freedom, of course, is the essential element of Passover. This is the beginning and the end of the incredible German Jewish culture um, from the Bird's Head Haggadah through the end of that incredible culture. This is the way I did the four children. There are many, many explanations of the four children, their ages, their intelligence, their moral qualities, their attitudes, their way of learning. The commonality in all, however, is that they are all different. The, the idea is that every child is different and every child therefore needs to be answered and addressed and raised in a different way. A message for teachers, for parents, that anyone who's had children knows that everyone is different and that they require different care. That's the basic idea of the four sons. Um, my metaphor for this were Renaissance playing cards. You see, I've done them as, as playing cards. And the reason is that, in, that as parents or teachers, we don't pick our children. We're kind of dealt them like a card game, given what we have and have to treat them, teach them, help them as best we can. Unlike everywhere else in the book where the text is written down and down, here I wrote the text across both pages. Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, Baruch Shenatan Torah Le'amo Yisrael Baruch Hu. I did this because I noticed that besides the four sons, the verse starts with four baruchs, four blessings. So I wanted graphically to arrange it so that each child is surrounded by a bracha, a blessing that every child is blessed and every child is different. You see a close up and notice at the end of the final half of each Baruch. I gave them a, each one a traditional blessing appropriate to each of them. For time, I'm going to move on. The flags. Text of each plague in the micrography going around as it appears, the text as it appears in Exodus. Dayenu, the stepped psalm, song of if God had done this and not done that, it would have been, I did it very structurally like steps with the ilu below, ilu below. And as I showed you at the beginning, the steps also cut into the pages at the bottom as we go through. Looking down to that seal, which we'll get to in about four, five or six pages. The three symbolic foods, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, I, each, I devoted a whole page to each one. Pesach, the Paschal Sacrifice. Matzah and Maror, the unleavened bread and the bitter.
In each and every generation, a person is required to see themselves as if they personally came out of Egypt. This is perhaps the essence of the telling of this tale, that it's not just a historical event that happened thousands of years ago, but we must figure out a way to so identify with it that we ourselves feel like we are coming out of, out of Egypt, coming, being liberated, and move to freedom during this ceremony tonight. But the language I, I, I saw in the Haggadah in each and every generation I picked up on, and a person must see himself, are the two themes that I went and took to visual and graphic form. In each and every generation, I did research and found how Jews actually dress. The men are over here, the women are over here. In every generation, going from Egypt to our modern times, the Holdor Vador. Between each portrait, I placed a mirror, a real little uh, acetate mirror for the idea of seeing oneself. Let me see them a little closer. You see the reflections of the mirror. And as you open the book at the side, you can see each one seeing him or herself in the mirror opposite. There you see the reflections. And the idea is when the book is closed, they're staring at themselves. As we open the book, we see them seeing themselves. And when the book is fully open, we see ourselves literally in the mirrors as the, the goddess says, in each and every generation, you must see yourself as if you came out of Egypt. Educators love this page because they say, you know, as long as the book is closed, you're not part of the picture. Only when it's open and you're looking in those mirrors and all the generations, that's when you become part of the ongoing tradition of all the generations of Jewish history. The praise, the raised cup in the middle, hallelujah at the bottom. The song, the Psalms of Hallel begin here, but Sait Yisrael means it's right when Israel came out of Egypt. I've done them as you can see the musical staff lined embossed into the parchment. The heads of the Jews are actually musical notes that play out two Mujit's Hasidic tunes to this psalm. There's a tradition in the Hasidic dynasty of Mujit's to write a new, new uh, tune to this psalm every year. So I wrote out two of them. The staffs that are the bar divisions that the Jews are carrying. So they're actually as they come out playing two, playing out two tunes. Here's that seal we saw about five pages ago and we were looking through the, the steps. This is the end of the Magid section. Um, and uh, the Mishnah says that we have to seal it off you have to end it with this blessing this telling of the tale you have to end off with this long blessing thanking god as redeemer of israel but the language that's used is that you have to be you must seal it with redemption and it means this long blessing of redemption but again i took it literally and used a first temple hebrew seal here at the bottom, which had belonged to a, I borrowed it from the Israel Museum, and then they made a, an impression of it from the original First Temple seal. It had belonged to a Jew named Shalem or Shalom, 
and it says Lish Shalom on it. Um, I enlarged it here so it fits within the text. Likvatenu Lish Shalom. It's in the Paleo Hebrew. And it's the smallest micrography in the book. This is tiny, tiny writing that has the last two chapters of Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, where he talks about the ultimate redemption and his vision of the Yeruba. You'll recall that there are places throughout when we drink the wine and eat the matzah that we're required to lean as a sign of freedom and leisure. So to help you remember that, I write the blessings on the side. So you have to lean over it to read it. So you shouldn't forget. All right, the sandwich. Again, this is all paper cut. This is all paper cut. So this is one, one side of the matzah, the maror. And as you flip the page, it moves to the other side. The image of the kotel, the Western wall at the top. This is all about memory, zecher, the mikdash. Zecher, you see it through. The set table on the right place to list the guests, the names of the guests that come every year to the Seder on the left. The eating of Apikoman. The doors of paradox. This is where we open the door. You saw before, I think I showed you live how it how it opens. These are all houses with open doors of many Jewish communities from around the world. The text that each community recites is different at this point. Here you see it being open so you can reveal the text beneath. And the text is each written in the language of that country. These, none of these are Hebrew. These are Jewish languages from all over the world in a map of that country with the text that they say at this point in the Seder in their own Judeo dialect, Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo Tat, Judeo Italian, and the open door. Pour out. The cup actually turns, as I showed you before. This is for you, LA people. Hallelujah. Let the la la, the bird singing, the Hallel is reiterated in the micrography in the birds. The notion of song and praise and singing. Let every living creature praise your name. Nishmat kochai tevarech et shimcha. Every living creature will praise your name. The images are one each of every phyla of the living world, all the biological phyla. They go on across the pages as the song, as the song is, is continued. The land and the fruit of her vine, this little book at the end, there are two variants on the blessing after the wine, one for wine from the land of Israel and one for wine outside of the land of Israel. And I put them in a little book that you can open and it can flip either way. The, the fruit of the vine or the fruit of her vine. 
if it's lying from those. Next year in Jerusalem, the final page. This echoes the first page, which was the whole Haggadah. And next year in Jerusalem rebuilt the walls of the old city, seen both from the side and the top simultaneously. And now this time the micrography, the micrographic writing is 70 different verses with 70 different names for Jerusalem. The names in red and the rest in black. And some of our kids are even in there. You'll see the dotted Riha Aliza, the happy center. Aliza is one of Aliza is one of my daughters. Here's Ariella. Ariella is a name for Jerusalem. And Ayona for young. This was pre Jackie, so she didn't get in. And I don't know that Jackie is a name for Jerusalem. Either. The Haggadah really ends here at next year in Jerusalem. All the songs were added in the late Middle Ages. So I had a kind of artistic dilemma. I wanted to include the songs because they're, of course, traditional. But I still wanted the book to end it next year in Jerusalem. So I did that by starting each one here on the, Most of them are alphabetic acrostics. So they read through the alphabet. So I did at the top here going Aleph, Beit, Gimel. They go to the physical end of the book and then they come back. At Mem, Hof, Lamed, Nun, they switch and then you read them backwards. So each song is read to the end and everyone ends back at next year in Jerusalem. Okay, so I think that got us through. Um, Uh, just a bit about the the history of the book. Uh, as I told you, it was done as a commission, one off, never intended to be printed. That's the reason I used the gold leaf and I used the paper cuts and the turning cups and the mirrors. I was doing one work for one family. So I had no restrictions. The intention was never to print the book. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, a few years after I finished it, the Nori family saw the photographs I had and said, it's unacceptable that there's one copy of this book in the world. It must be shared with the Jewish world. Let's go into business and print it and distribute. I said, that's very kind, Neil, but there's no way this book can be printed. It's so complicated and all these special techniques. But he was insistent and he said, no, we will find someone. You will find someone somewhere in the world that can print this book to your satisfaction, make an exact duplicate of it down to the every technique, the colors, the size, the detail. And our family moved to Europe for a summer and I was running off every week to Austria and Switzerland and France and Italy um, looking for a printer and finally found this incredible printer, Martito Martersteig in Verona, Italy. I looked at his work and knew immediately that he could do it. He looked at the photographs and knew that he could do it. And it took a year. We borrowed the back, book back and produced this perfect facsimile copy with all the paper cuts the hand applied mirrors. It in, comes in two volumes. The second volume, because of the research and the idea base of this book, I felt there had to be a second volume where for each page of the book, I wrote an article explaining the ideas behind it, what went into it and how I got to it. 
So those are the, the two volumes that come with the facsimile edition. This is the companion volume. It has the, the notes on each page in Hebrew and English and a duotone reprint of the Agata for reference. We later then published a trade edition, now in its fourth printing, and a deluxe edition, which is sort of in between the two. If you're interested, put your emails in the chat. Esther will reach out to you. Whoever is leading this, if Rebecca is still there, you should tell me if we can do questions or we should. And I'll stop screen sharing and we can chat. Thank you so much for that, David. That was amazing and it is beautiful. Um, love to open it up to any questions. Start with Tybal. Um, so I, I'm not going to use the word favorite because it would be like asking you which, and you're, you have more than one child, but when you now look back at how you married text and images, are there any pages that stand out in particular that you really feel a lot of satisfaction or fulfillment when you think about how you did it? Um, great question. Um, I, I don't really, I think they're, I think they're fairly, in my mind, they're fairly even because they're all based on this, this three-part thing that I talked about at the beginning of listening carefully to the text, coming up with some idea, and then the creative challenge of translating that idea into, into visual. So that that's done in very different ways for each page, but I feel like the um, kind of the answer to your question is that the it was the procedure rather than the individual pages that I felt was really the essence of the of the work, and then it was applied to the different pages. If that makes sense, good question. Other Bible again. Well, because no one else. So um, from a family of musicians, and I actually do own this, one of the editions and had bought it as gifts when it came out. And I had never focused before today on, I think it was, was it hollow? But it was the section where the human image, the images of the Jews were musical notation. Yeah. And I'm, interested now that I'm looking at my copy, how you decided the color, if there's anything that you could add to how you picked what those Jews were gonna look like as the images of the music. Um, the, in terms of the dress? The colors, the dress, the- No, the, the, it, was, it was fairly random, the-, the, um, the musically well first the the you know if you're a musician you'll have to, uh, a great deal of trouble playing this because i wrote it from right to left the hebrew way rather than the music way so that's that's the first thing i should say about it and the second thing is that these these um uh, velvo pasternak uh blessed memory was very helpful to me in 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 getting the tunes and the other thing uh, about them was um, musically, I cheated a little bit, included all the musical repeats and fussed a little bit with a few notes so that it would come out to exactly 600 notes for the 600,000 Jews that came out of Egypt. So the two tunes, it, it works on both sides of the page. Um, and the two tunes together have 600 notes or little Jews. Nothing special about the, um, about the um, costumes, I would say. Cindy? David, 
I have a question. Sorry. I got Cindy here. Hi, David. Um, we met, of course, in 2005. And um, I am just so, first of all, um, may Roz's memory always be for a blessing. It's the first time I, I actually guys. see you just since. You. Um, Jim and I and all our family are so grateful to you for your genius, how you um take the essence of judaism and make it at the same time simple and complex and as beautiful as it is you beautify it more so uh countless thanks and we love you and this was so great thank you. <laughs> love from texas and california <laughs> okay thank you and thanks for being a continual member of my subscription minion plan. And may we continue to send you beautiful things often. Leora? I have a question. Uh, and if, uh, is there a qualitative difference between the first 500 uh, uh, copies that were generated uh, versus what's available today? Uh, definitely. The, what are the, they? Yeah. The biggest difference, well, the biggest difference is the size. The, the original limited edition is the actual size of the original. The quality of the printing is, is different um it's just a, a a different realm it's it's virtually indistinguishable from the original um the only but, way you can really tell the difference is that the original parchment is a little wavy and the paper is flat but everything else is is just dead on and perfect um the other editions are very nice replicas uh, and especially the deluxe one, the latest one we've done, which has the paper cuts, which is done on is two volumes, like the facsimile, is a very, I, I, I love, I should maybe show you, the, show you those, but. Um, studio so I have them this is the format of the both the uh, trade edition and the deluxe edition mm -hmm. but the deluxe edition has the paper cuts which is really makes it very special and the very beautiful special paper that it's done on it has the hand applied mirrors and it you know for a for a commercial reproduction mm -hmm. it's it's very good it's two volumes with the Hebrew and English in the second volume. And the trade edition, which is done very well and it's been very popular, um, is also beautifully printed. And it has doesn't have the paper cuts, though it comes with a frameable paper cut. Both editions come with the frameable paper cut. And, you know. The first edition, that. was the first edition also done on parchment? No, it's on paper, but a paper made especially for the for the book to resemble the parchment. You can't get the quality of printing on parchment. Other questions about the the editions? There are also prints of some of the uh, the pages that we did at the same time as the facsimile to the same quality. Um, yeah, I have a question. Leora, go ahead. Thank you. So first, David, I, I have the trade edition, which I've had since I got married almost 32 years ago, and it's been with us at every Seder. And we also have both the frameable woodcut and um, this beautiful page on our wall, which is the right before the third cup um, in our dining room. So we look at these all the time. But, and I just appreciate, I just want to also add my thanks to um, the brilliance of this and how much it has enriched my Passover Seders for 32 years. 
I have a question because, um, you know, there's a way in which a great work of art just seems like it should always have been like this and everything is perfect, but most people go through drafts. And I just wonder, were there places of the process of creating this where you um, got to a dead end and started all over? Are, are there any pages in it where it wasn't right at the beginning and you went to a new idea? Um, that's an interesting question, and it's a long time ago, so I'm not um, remembering perfectly, but um, if there were, I, I don't recall any. Um, at the beginning, I may have done some, I generally do very rough sketches on the, on the parchment itself, uh, and basically work right on it. So my sketches would be done before on paper, very rough, and then I would just start working right on the parchment. I don't do a, I, I would never do a, a uh, do it twice uh, as a practice or something like that. Um, so, you know, I don't think, I don't think there were, were any, there may have been one that I did two versions of. I, I seem to remember maybe one page that I did two versions of, but I basically worked, you know, worked straight through from beginning to end. Um, I should say that in, in terms of process, which is, is, is really what you're asking about, um, I deliberately, the first six months I worked on it, I deliberately uh, made no sketches or drawings. I was just strictly research and notes and ideas and I, I just was was doing research and, and immersing myself in the book. Um, after about six months, then I started working page by page and would do sketches and, and I'd work out ideas and drawings and that sort of thing, and then go to the parchment. Uh, so that, that was kind of the process. Thank you. Beautiful. And thank you so much for this presentation. I really enjoyed it. You're welcome. Do we have any more questions for David? All right. Well, thank you again, David. This was an amazing presentation. Um, the books are beautiful. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in them, you can drop your email address in the chat. Um, or you can reach out directly um, to David or Esther for more information. Um, I hope you will join us next week on Wednesday for our Haggadah Slam. Uh, that will be Wednesday evening at Temple Beth Am. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And thank you again. Jim, did you have a, or did you have some? Oh, you were just waving. I saw Jim. You have to unmute. David, it's just so wonderful to see you. Just so wonderful. And we're so happy to hear you talk about the Haggadah again. And it's all fresh and new. And we're so lucky to get to do it. And we thank um, Temple Beth Am because although we're in, in Texas and from Texas, our children live in LA. They belong to Beth Am. And our granddaughter is at Pressman Academy. So Temple Beth Am, we think you all are great. And I have actually was there last week walking my granddaughter into Pressman. So it was, so thank you all for bringing David to us on the screen. Anyhow, you, you look, you look, you look good. And we love it's, you. It's a lot. Rosh here and not there. So I'll wish you a good month of Nissan and uh, Shabbat Shalom and uh, Hag Sameach to all. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Those of you who I know and those of you who I don't. Hamon Hamon Toda Vichibuk Gadol. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Apologies for the late start. <laughs>